we have been bouncing a bit between, in the last class we read King, Charles King chapter 10, called Indian Country, and I ended with this slide showing you Zora Neale Hurston, Elacora Deloria, and then her nephew, Vine Deloria Jr., who was not enthused about anthropologists coming to study uh, Native Americans. But the quote from that King was emphasizing was how these Deloria's work and Herson's work were an indication of, of the, the best of anthropology and in, in showing how people were, were fully human and in the now and in the present. And sometimes I've liked the connections between these two books sometimes, but sometimes they're just accidental, like this wonderful connection, because I told you that Deloria was a part of the Standing Rock Reservation, the Standing Rock Sioux. And Nick, what do we learn? What do we first learn as we get right open the, the chapter? Something um, happens. Yeah, which reservation was it? It's the Standing Rock Reservation. Yay, the connection comes through. There it was. A very huge, mobilized a lot of people, a lot of social media. But it turns out, yes, in the end, seems like, seems like they, they just Put the pipeline in. But I say this, I think that this illustrates that the issues of indigenous Americans and native peoples are, are still with us. They're still very much alive in the present. And these uh, Dakota access, uh, very name, the naming of places. And some of you may have noticed that some baseball teams have been changing their names. Now it's the Cleveland Guardians and other things. So these issues are 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 very present, very with us. And they Fortunately, I think won't be going away. People thought they were going to go away, but they won't. So this is a good, uh, good lead in. Thanks, Nick. Good lead in to this chapter on politics and power and how people organize. So I wanted to begin with the question of why we study politics and anthropology. Why we, why would we be doing this instead of in a political science class? And one of the answers, or one of the reasons, is that this is a deep philosophical concern in European and uh, Euro-American Euro societies, which is ideas about how people are in a state of nature versus how they are in, in organized society. And the philosopher Thomas Hobbes, back in 1651, stated in, in, in a kind of way that would influence our thoughts for a long time, it keeps emerging, that people, man, in a state of nature, was engaged in, it's doing the Latin there, the bellum omnium contra omnes, or the war of everyone against everyone. And so Hobbes believed that in, in sort of our natural state, it was just pure competition, everybody fighting each other. He's also famously the person who said that life in a state of nature was nasty, brutish, and short. So this is something that anthropologists have debated about the, the hunter and gatherers ever since that time. Now, interestingly, in terms of economics, I think that for the most part, our belief is that, yeah, that's great. The war of everybody against everybody, competition, cutthroat competition. We all seem to believe that economic class are just about making as much money as you can. 
And the idea is, according to a misguided appropriation of Adam Smith's invisible hand, that in the market, if everybody just does follows their self-interest, the market mechanism will work things out and it will work to the benefit of society as long as everybody's following their own self-interest in the market. So in the marketplace, uh, there's this belief that that's the way to do things. Basically, you're not trying to all kill each other, but you're trying to you know, rise to the top by looking only after yourself, everybody for themselves, every man for himself. But for politics, uh, Hobbes <laughs> suggested that the war of all against all was not going to be a good idea. So what do you need to do? What do you need to have if man in a state of nature is just going to be fighting it out? What do you need in the Hobbesian point of view? Yeah. <clears throat> huh? A rather strict government to keep us in line. Yes, Hobbes wrote, this was the Leviathan, the state, the government. Got to keep those people in line. And so, again, this, this actually emerges a lot in our own ideas, right? The ideas we're probably seeing ads about crime. The idea is, if the police don't come in and knock some heads around, then people are just going to be stealing things from each other and killing each other. And we need a police force or an army to make people behave, to make people do the right thing. If we just leave them alone, they're going to be bad. They're going to be bad to each other. And so the Hobbesian point of view is rather pessimistic because uh, you need this very strong, or well, maybe people like it. Some people like it. Uh, you need this very strong state or strong, strong police control in order, to, uh, in order to make sure things are done. So this, there's this kind of... Uh, there's, there's often a tension in our society between things that we want to leave to the market. We want to say, okay, we want to privatize that and we want that to be monetary. We want that to be all money and you can exchange and fight and compete over it. And things that we want to turn over to the state and have be politically organized. Actually, Brady, you had one of those that was an interesting one. What happens with something that think we should just be able to turn on. Well, I like to turn it off. The shower, man, it just kept leaking. I wanted to turn it off. I couldn't get it off. But what's going on there? Obviously, with everyday uh, it's just being made into a product and being sold back to uh, humans. It's, uh, it's kind of how society is now how society is now. Yeah, so, so should something like water be privatized, something that is so basic and, and needed, right? And in a lot of societies, they would say, no, water is a human right. You should all have the right to water. Well, that's where the state comes in, right? The political organization to provide water, because that's a human right. Whereas other people are like, no, let's let's turn it over to the markets, the corporations. We're going to privatize that. Should pay for how much water you use, and then we're going to we're going to make if we put it in the market sphere, they're going to make it more efficient. If everybody just fights it out, it'll lead to more efficiency in water. And you know, there's an there's an argument to be made there. Similar argument with healthcare, right? Is healthcare a human right? Do we all deserve it? Should it be provided by the government? Or is it better to be privatized? Everybody fighting it out. You can afford more health care, you get more. <laughs> now, these are arguments that we have, right? Debates that we have in our society about where this proper sphere of things is between state control and market control. Competition and, and state control. Now, in anthropology, well... Flowing from Hobbes, before we get to anthropology, flowing from Hobbes, there is an assumption that the institutions that existed in European and American, North American societies were the correct way to do the state. As long as you had people that looked like this, then you'd have government, law, politics, keeping everybody in line. 
And there's an assumption running through our society is that people who look like this don't have law, government, politics, so that they would be either backwards or lacking in these things or strange. In these things. And so we have this terminology, for example, we call some people stateless, which is they don't have a government, so we, it's, it's marked by its absence, right? Stateless. And we still have, I'm not sure if anybody believes this anymore, but I think some people do, that when we go out and fight people in Iraq or something, we're, we're going to spread democracy, spreading democracy around the world. Oh, like I said, I'm probably we're too cynical to believe that anymore. But in the old days, people believed that we could, we could go to war and give people democracy as our, our gift to them. So, uh, you know, we have, we have this idea that, that, that there's a certain way that we should do democracy or do politics, and there's other people who don't have that. Now, when anthropologists kind of hit the scene, the problem was, or I mean, the, the issue was, how are people organizing in the absence of these kind of state structures and government structures that we were used to looking for. And when anthropologists would go out to these societies, what was fascinating were how people seemed to be able to organize even if they lived in so-called stateless societies. And one of the things that, uh, well, First of all, let me talk about those, you know, those those festivals, the potlatches that would organize people economically or, or leveling mechanisms that we talked about in the economics chapter. So you'd have these these systems that would organize people and involved a lot of coordination, but didn't seem to have a central government. And the other thing is that a lot of anthropologists were going into colonial areas, areas that were uh being subdued by another power, and the people would be resisting colonialism. And so it was kind of a, a puzzle, right? If people didn't have a state or a government, how are they getting people together in order to fight off the, the, the Brits? And in fact, one of the most famous uh, anthropological examples of kinship and lineage organization, Evans Pritchard, about the new air was basically about how lineages and kinship and those kinds of patrilineal ties that we talked about could be a way to organize people without necessarily having to have a state or a government controlling them. And like I said, this was a particular obsession of the Brits because they were trying to colonize this area and people were rising up against them. And it was like, well, how are they doing this? So Evans Pritchard was there and he said, well, they can do this because of the, the lineage system, their kinship systems. So this became an idea of how people organize outside of that, uh, outside of a state government. And so anthropologists, as some of you said, are looking at those kinds of institutions and social ideas that are kind of under the surface, that are hard to see. We might not recognize them as a court or a law, but if you spend time in that society, they seem to work in a similar fashion to the kinds of things that, we, that we've seen. So, We're going to talk about some of those some of those things. I'm going to skip by the next slide. So just close your eyes for a second. All right. <laughs> huh? Now you can open your eyes. There you go. <laughs> so one of the ways that we can see uh, different institutions and things functioning in societies is by how societies are organized and their relationship to power. Evan, what's a good example of power? What do we first think of when we think about power? Um, 
Yeah, and what can the military do to us? <laughs> Why is it a good example of power? Yeah, and they have the, the stuff, the stuff to back it up, right? So this is called, when most people think about power, we think about this, which is coercive power. This stuff that has, if you don't do this, something's going to happen to you and you're not going to like it. You're going to get thrown in jail. If you don't obey what's going on, then coercive power comes into play. However, there may be a better form of power, which is persuasive power, which is that I'm going to try to convince you. You should... <laughs> Why are you shaking your head, Cyrus? Never works? Oh, it can work. Can, theoretically. The common is never works, so that clearly didn't work. <laughs> well, Felicia, where might it work? Where might persuasive power work? Who might have persuasive power in another society that's not the communist? The big man. The big man in different societies has prestige and persuasive power. Now, for those of you who've seen Unka's Big Monka or been forced to watch it where Unka's going around and he's trying to convince them to give him pigs to feed into a ceremony, the filmmakers say... Unka has, is very great at persuading, he's got very great speech-making skills, but he doesn't have coercive power. He can't make them do things. What kind of power do I have over you? <laughs> great. Yeah, so I tried to be persuasive. I tried to tell you that this is good for you. But the coercive part is the grade. I guess I don't have any much more than that. That's my, that's the, <laughs> which is not very coercive, right? It's like, I think it is. There you go. <laughs> There you go. And that is the line between the B minus and the C plus. As we know, <laughs> you sink below that, your life is over. <laughs> yep, yep. That's what happened to Bill Gates. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there are many roads to power. One of the other things that we have are social controls. Actually, this is kind of related to persuasive power. Francis, what's a good, what's one form of social control? Internalized controls, what are those? Yeah, kind of like if you're writing the paper, not because you're trying to get the C plus, but because you really feel like you want to do it and it's the right thing to do and you're producing something that's good and we're all in agreement about that. So if we have these internalized controls about what is right and good and you know, morality is can can be one of those controls. These can seem very natural, and so I don't need to, you don't need to do that much persuading in order to say, well, you know, it's a, you don't want to don't punch them. <laughs> Not a good idea. Don't need to have don't need to have that coer coercive power. There are also externalized controls or sanctions. And some of those can be very coercive, right? Going to jail, a monetary sanction, a fine, being able to find someone, a grade. A grade might be considered a sanction. Trying to control people to make them do, do, do things. There's an interesting externalized control which 
Gonzalez discusses, which is gossip. And uh, for those of you who maybe grew up in a small town, you know how this works, <laughs> right? You don't want to do anything because so-and-so is going to hear about it. And if they hear about it, then everybody's going to hear about it. And then your reputation is ruined. So gossip can kind of work as a sanction. It also helps to reinforce those internalized controls because you don't want to be the subjected to gossip. Like I said, for those of you who grew up in a small college, you might know how this works. And, it, and you don't want to don't want to do things. So in what Gonzalez calls non-state societies, societies that don't necessarily have a state government, also called uncentralized systems, they tend to prioritize uh, kinship or lineage ties we've talked about. So organization based on, on family or, or fictive family. They tend to prioritize these kinds of internalized controls or things like gossip in order to keep people in line. They also often have leaders that are, that are more informal. They may be temporary. They may be called in to, uh, to judge a certain matter, but they aren't, they aren't granted with the title of judge for life. They're simply people who are considered wise in the community. So they might have informal leaders. They also may have things like age sets, so uh, groups of people or sometimes gender based, sometimes all the brothers or I mean all the elder men of a certain generation are the ones who are running the are, are running the the system or able to uh, sanction other people. So these are things that happen uh, as uh, as Gonzalez says, in, in non-state societies or uncentralized systems. Now, uh, she talks about, and it's kind of a classic typology in anthropology of non-state societies. Uh, she talks about bands, which most, mostly correspond to hunting and gathering forms of organizations, tribes, which mostly correspond to pastoral herding societies or small-scale agriculture, and chiefdoms, which are larger units, which mostly correspond to intensive agriculture, in which you have something that starts to look pretty centralized uh, in this society. I'm not a big fan of these terms, I have to say. They've been... They're famous in anthropology, but they also have meanings outside of anthropology. Most of us, I think, outside of anthropology would say that chiefs and tribes are the same thing. The tribes have chiefs. I mean, that's just a stereotype, right? And so I think that it's in anthropology, we use these terms to delineate sometimes certain units, but outside of anthropology, they have these these ideas. The other reason I don't like these terms is because they were often solidified during colonialism. And the Europeans were always looking for leaders. And so they'd come in and as those stereotypical films say, take me to your chief, take me to your leader. And they'd take them to whoever was in charge at the time. And they would say, okay, you're the, you're the chief, you do this, you have this role in this society. And they would often take what was more temporary and try to make it permanent, try to make it into a hierarchy. And so many of the ideas we have about what a chief is come to us from people from the outside trying to look for leaders in our society. The other thing I don't like about these terms is because there's always a kind of lurking inevitability. For example, in the chiefdoms on page 198, Gonzalez says that they are pre-industrial. They are intensive agriculture, but pre-industrial. Now, when we say something is pre-industrial, it implies that they are about to become industrial. They're somehow before that, but they're verging upon it. And so it has this, when we use the word uncentralized, 
that's kind of a the negative term for something that we see positively as centralized. So I'm not a big fan of this system. I think it can be used carefully as long as you keep several points in mind. First of all, that these are kind of, they're not, they're not systems that are, as, as Gonzalez says, if we see them more as, as points on a continuum, so they're not sort of set for all time in these places, and that people as individuals or whole groups might move back and forth between and among these social forms. We also should realize that all of these societies are interacting and trading with each other and talking to each other. And any society in today's world, even if they say they, even if to a certain extent they are organized as a band or a tribe or a chieftain, they are also part of a state. There are no societies today that are living outside of a state government. Uh, those are just have been spread all over the world. Now, a lot of the things that I, this is what I used to say about this. A book came out uh, last year called The Dawn of Everything, A New History of Humanity by David Graeber and David Wengro, uh, which is about some of the archeology span of this stuff. And what they were basically saying is, again, questioning these typologies, they made a couple of additional points, which is that often if we look at how people organize themselves, they would be sometimes very big and very almost in, in an almost urban society in say the summer. And then in the winter, they would disperse and be very much more band-like. So one of their points is how uh, human history has been marked by the seasonality, which we often uh, have overlooked. And one of their other huge points is that People over thousands of years have experimented with all different kinds of social organization. And that if we look back at the archaeological record, and they have a whole different interpretation of Teotihuacan, uh, which uh, Gonzalez discusses here in the, the revolution that happened there, uh, that we, we can have large scale societies without necessarily imposing upon a centralized structure or a stratification. And this is a pretty big claim because most of us, including Gonzalez, believe that as societies get bigger, they have to be centralized. They have to be stratified. You have to have somebody ruling over them. In fact, some of you said that leveling mechanisms could never work. We need rulers, we need people to tell us what to do. So this is a pretty, it's a pretty, big rethinking of the archaeological evidence and uh, human history. And that's why next semester, for those of you who want to be anthropology majors or minors, the history of anthropological thought will be reading this book. Pretty big. It'll take us all semester. Hmm? I've been listening to it on audio book, so, you know, a lot of pain. <laughs> I listen to it pretty fast, so yeah. <laughs> it's not very expensive, actually. It's uh, it's a book. I don't know. I have to look it up. I don't. It's definitely not two hundred bucks. I don't even think it's a hundred. So for those of you who are excited about, there's uh, there's actually a couple different versions of the class you can take. We'll see you here. All right. Uh, so Gonzalez also, we might as well talk about those state societies, those centralized societies. Gonzalez tells us that these are places that we know and love where there is a formalized central government with authority to use force. So the state has a central government, and that government has authority to use force. Don't copy this next quote down because you can find it on the internet, but I just want you to be aware of where 
Gonzalez and others are borrowing this idea from, it actually comes to us from uh, the German sociologist Max Weber in an essay lecture called Politics as a Vocation. Really interesting idea of a state. A human community that successfully claims the monopoly of the legitimate use of physical force within a given territory. So the only people who should be able to use physical force is right the police or the agents of the state. And what Weber was saying is you have a government or you have a state government when people acknowledge that that has a monopoly of the legitimate use of force. So what that means is that states, governments, when they, they're trying to suppress the idea of raids or feuds, right? In the old days, you'd have people, okay, well, you killed my grandma, so I'm going to kill your uncle. And then that comes into a feud and they're going to raid the, so there'd be this back and forth. And the state would say, no, <laughs> if, you know, just because somebody hurts you, it's the police or the state that's supposed to step in and the law, you don't get to go out and ride, go, go to the other group and raid them. So states usually try to pacify these internal conflicts. But when it comes to wars, that's usually between states. In the old days, when they had raids and feuds, you really didn't have as much, you might say, large-scale warfare where it's not just your uncle, you're just going in and devastating the population. So this is something that arises with the state. There's a little box in here. None of you were as interested in, perhaps as I was, on cannibalism. And uh, not sure exactly why this comes up. I guess it has to do with war and politics. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the cannibalism thing. On page 206 in this box, Food Matters, Cannibalism. <laughs> Weird title, yeah, food, cannibalism. Uh, Gonzalez tells us that it was the Carib societies, the places in the Caribbean, it was the probable origin of the term cannibal. Now, what she is talking about here is members of the Carib society in today's Venezuela, Guyana, and adjacent Caribbean islands when the Spanish arrived in the New World. Now, let us say the Spanish are arriving in the New World, which is 500 plus years ago, and they're coming back telling us about these people who are in Carib land and are cannibals. Should we trust these guys? Why not? You can make all that stuff up so easy. <laughs> Hello. What might be good if you, if, why might you want to tell the people back home that? Those people out there were cannibals. You might want to keep them for yourself. Sure. Yeah, sorry. Legitimize your rule over them because if you didn't conquer them, they'd just be eating each other, right? So, yeah, we shouldn't trust these. We shouldn't trust the Spanish accounts. Cannibalism becomes a sort of obsession of the Europeans. <laughs> they get really into it. And I'm not saying that nobody has ever done cannibalism before. Obviously people have, and it's probably been done. But a lot of the stories that we have have been way exaggerated or misinterpreted. And one of the things that would happen is, is people would go into other societies and they would want to know if they were cannibals there. Now the question is, how do you ask somebody 
if they are a cannibal, if you don't speak their language, how would you ask? Well, how's that? The word for food. <laughs> That would be pretty extreme. And if, if if you were to do that, what would they think about you? Yeah. All right, let's back up from let's back up from the extreme example. A lot of it would it, you'd have to mime it, right? You'd have to use like you'd point to them and you'd point to your arm. And you know, if you're not gonna do the full serving mechanism. And you, you know, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a huge pantomime play you'd put on there with the whole apparatus. But let's just back up and say you could do it with miming. Again, if you looked at the person who was miming this, you're thinking, wait, you're going to eat me? <laughs> like, what's the deal here? And so, you know, so there's this whole misinterpretation of, you know, how, do, how do you even say that? And then once people figured out that the Europeans, like let's say you had these people coming into your society with these ships and guns and stuff, and they were really against cannibals, what are you gonna tell them? It can be used to like scare people off. So you can exaggerate your own. And I think that may have been what was happening with the Caribs because they're like exaggerating their own fierceness in order to keep these people away. But more commonly you would say, oh no, 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 we don't do that. But those guys over there, they're definitely cannibals. Go get them, right? So there was this whole kind of, when you look into the stories of cannibalism, it was often about, oh yeah, that's what we used to do. That's what those people do, uh, you know, or, or yes, that's what we do and stay away. There's an interesting uh, passage on this uh, in, uh, in the King chapter that we just read uh, where George Hunt uh, gets, or sends a letter to Boaz and he says, you know, that that a chief had told him, someone told him a, him a speech that you had made about that you have been all around the world and seen everything change for the best except the Quahutal tribe that they eat dead people. This is a big accusation. Uh, it was because of a, this dance that was called the Cannibal Dance, which was actually a dance that was to warn people about the dangers of cannibalism from inside Kwaku society. But it gets again misinterpreted as, aha, they're cannibals. So as we've talked about, we have to be careful about this because it can be used to, as Sarah said, to justify conquest, but also as a way of trying to manipulate and frighten others. And once people realize that someone else is obsessed about this, uh, people often tend to exaggerate. Again, I'm not trying to say, obviously cannibalism has in various ways happened, but perhaps not to the extent that it was being looked at. Now, sometimes I get way down on, on the Europeans and the Spanish. I want to bring up uh, somebody who was writing around the same time as, uh, as Hobbes, some of the early Spanish explorers, uh, Montaigne wrote an essay called On Cannibals around the year 1580, so quite a while ago. Some people consider Montaigne to be one of the more perceptive people, maybe a, a, an early precursor to anthropology and the idea of cultural relativism. So he's he hadn't been to the land, but he was writing about the people that he was hearing about, and it had been, you know, 100 years. And he wrote something interesting. He said, from a European perspective, he was French. We are justified in calling these people barbarians by reference to the laws of reason. So the first part of it, you're like, wait a second. 
That's exactly what the Europeans thought. They thought that other people were barbarians by reference to the laws of reason. So the first, this is his first part. And so he says, yeah, if we just go in the abstract and, and compare them to the laws of reason, that's justified they're barbarians. But not in comparison with ourselves who surpass them in every kind of barbarity. <laughs> so what he was saying is, Sure, if we have the ideals of Christianity or laws and we're living them out, maybe we're justified in saying that. But if we compare them with our actual selves, we're surpassing these so-called cannibals in every kind of barbarity, and we've proven it time after time. So I just wanted to point out that not everyone was, was a Hobbesian. There were other people who had ideas about how people could organize in a different society. One of the reasons I bring this idea up is the idea of the laws of reason and what Gonzalez or, uh, refers to in another box earlier about the justification of war and the idea of a rational discourse. And this is uh, from uh, this is from the anthropologist Carol Cohn's work, who is talking about how people were describing things like nuclear missiles and ways in which uh, warfare became something that you could just push a button and missiles fly off and 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 deliver deliver a, a payload to people far away and what she's found is that all these things became became abstractions they became a series of euphemisms and that she as she became, talk to these missile designers, defense analysts a lot, she was unable to express a sort of what you might call a, a, an anti-war stance. And if she did, they'd say that she was a hippie or she's dumb, that her own values were outside of this so-called rational discourse. So this relates to something about language and our sensitization of things and the idea of rationality. Now, the idea of rational discourse brings us to something that I have found the most useful in analyzing politics. Uh, Pierre Bourdieu does not come up in this chapter. Uh, he came up when we were talking about social capital and some of the, the it's come up a couple times in chapter one and we we're talking about social capital in the prisons. But I find this although it has some big words in it, it'd be a really useful way to think about the kinds of political debates that we have. What Bourdieu is saying here is that in any society, or in, let's say, in our society, you have what is the realm of opinion. And this is the realm, what he calls the universe of discourse or debate. So whenever you see two people on TV, YouTube debating each other, it's because they oper that's operating in the universe of discourse. And he says there's going to be an orthodox position, traditional position, and a heterodox position. So you might call this right versus left or conservative, liberal. Underlying that is what he calls the universe of the undiscussed or the undisputed, what he called doxa. Things that people don't talk about, but everybody just accepts. And so in some ways, what underlies a debate are a shared set of premises, and those premises are not necessarily up for debate. I guess in this country, one of those for a long time was that we should have an election, right? That's a premise. That's the undiscussed. Now people are sort of discussing that more. It's become debatable. But I think for the most part, people believe there should be an election. There should be multiple. There should be at least two sides. There should be two people to vote for, right? So the undiscussed is that there should be an election or a democracy. So you can think about this in terms of things that we debate and the assumptions that we make. 
one example that might help you to think about this. Uh, the idea of, of same-sex marriage, gay marriage, right? If we go back to the 1950s, nobody was even thinking that that was a possibility. It was in the universe of the undiscussed in the sense that it wasn't up for debate. There was no position to be had on it because nobody was even talking about it, right? And then during the, I guess especially during the 80s and the 90s, it enters into the realm of debate or opinion. And you have the orthodoxy saying, no way, marriage is between male and female, it's always been. And you have the heterodoxy saying, no, we're gonna expand this out. Pretty big debate, right? It was actually a very big debate. I would say for the most part, at least among your generation, maybe in some other parts, it passed back now into the realm of the undisputed, into the realm of the undiscussed. It's assumed that this should just be something that everybody has access to. Same sex, that's fine. Now, it seems to be, if I read politics correctly, that it's coming back into the realm of the disputed, the realm of the opinion or discourse. But for a lot of people, I think it's become part of the assumed or the undiscussed. So you can do this. I mean, it's an interesting exercise that you can do with some with various issues is to try and figure out, is this something that that is that is part of the undiscussed? What makes this debatable at all? What kind of debate are we having? 